Steve Jobs co-founded Apple Inc. and revolutionized technology with the Macintosh, iPod, iPhone, and iPad. But he loved design, creativity, and invention in all forms. His story embodies the business creation myth. Steve Jobs co-founded Apple in his parents' garage in 1976, was fired in 1985, returned to save it from bankruptcy in 1997, and by the time he died in October 2011, had made it the world's most valuable company. He transformed personal computing, animated movies, music, phones, tablet computing, retail outlets, and digital publishing. He joins Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and Walt Disney in the galaxy of American innovators. These individuals were not saints, but their inventiveness in technology and business will live forever. Now, before we start with our session, if you like this video, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell, never to miss an update from the Invensys Learning Channel. Also, if you're looking for an online training certification in PMP, check out the link given in the description box below. So, without any further ado, let's get started with our video. The first lesson is to focus. Apple was making a variety of computers and peripherals, including 12 Macintosh models, when Jobs returned in 1997. After weeks of product reviews, he was done. Stop. It's insane. He walked barefoot to a whiteboard and sketched a 2 by 2 grid with a magic marker. Here's what we need, he said. He put consumer and pro above the columns. He named the rows desktop and portable. He encouraged his team to focus on four strong quadrant products. Cancel all goods. Shock silence. He saved Apple by focusing on creating four computers. Deciding what not to do is as crucial as what to do, he informed me. Companies and products. After writing the company, Jobs began taking his top 100 on annual retreats. On the penultimate day, he stood in front of a whiteboard and asked, what are the 10 things we should be doing next? The list would be contested. Jobs wrote them down and crossed off the dumb ones. The group settled on 10 after much haggling. Jobs cut the bottom seven and said, we can only do three. Jobs was Zen trained and focused. He relentlessly eliminated distractions. Colleagues and family members would sometimes be agitated trying to convince him to address legal or medical matters they felt were significant. He would gaze coldly and refuse to change his laser-like focus until he was ready. The second lesson is to simplify. Jobs' Zen-like approach simplified things by focusing on their essence and deleting unnecessary components. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, claimed Apple's first marketing brochure. Compared to Apple software, Microsoft Word gets uglier and more cluttered with non-intuitive navigational ribbons and obnoxious features. Appreciates Apple's simplicity. Jobs, a college dropout working the Atari night shift, valued simplicity. Atari games had no manuals and had to be beginner-friendly. He learned to appreciate minimalism in design at Bauhaus-style Aspen Institute seminars in the late 1970s. When Jobs visited Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center and saw the designs for a computer with a graphical user interface and a mouse, he made it more intuitive and simpler. For example, the Xerox mouse had three buttons and cost $300. Jobs went to a local industrial design business and told one of its founders, Dean Hovey, that he wanted a $15 single-button model. Hovey obeyed. Jobs simplified complexity. He realized that this level of simplicity would build a user-friendly computer. To make things simple, fully comprehend the underlying challenges and come up with attractive solutions takes a lot of hard work, he remarked. Johnny Ive was Jobs' soulmate. Minimalism and decluttering are complex. Understanding screws, buttons, and navigational screens allowed removal. To be very simple, you have to go pretty deep, I've added. Screws simplify a product. Learning how simplicity is made is great. Jobs wanted clutter-free iPod interfaces. Demanded three-click access. Search by song, album, or artist was one navigation panel. Why? Demanded Jobs. He would go, did you think of this? Recounts iPod project leader Tony Fidel. He'd reinterpret the problem or method, solving our tiny dilemma. Jobs suggested removing the on slash off button. Surprised, the crew decided the button was unnecessary. The device would slowly power off and resume when utilized. When presented with a complicated set of planned navigation menus for IVED, which burned video onto discs, Jobs sprang up and sketched a rectangle on a whiteboard. He announced the new application. One window. Drag your video into the window. Click burn. Finish. We'll make that. Jobs often inquired who was overcomplicating products to find disruptable industries. That led to the iPod and iTunes stores in 2001. Cell phones followed. 
At meetings, Jobs would take a phone and yell that nobody could figure out half the functionality, including the address book. At the end of his career, he targeted the television industry, making it nearly hard for consumers to click on a basic gadget to watch what they desired. The third lesson is to accept responsibility from beginning to end. Jobs realized that integrating hardware, software, and peripherals was the key to simplicity. An Apple ecosystem, an iPod connected to a Mac with iTunes software, made devices easier, syncing smoother, and faults rarer. Making new playlists on the computer frees up the iPod's buttons for simpler activities. Jobs and Apple were rare in taking full responsibility for user experience. The customer experience was strongly tied to the iPhone's ARM microprocessor performance to buying it in an Apple store. Microsoft in the 1980s, and Google recently opened their operating systems and applications to hardware manufacturers. That sometimes works better. Jobs was adamant that it produced crappier products. People are busy, he remarked. They're too busy to think about integrating their laptops and devices. Jobs' authoritarian mentality drove him to own the whole widget. His desire for precision and exquisite items also drove it. He experienced hives or worse thinking about using great Apple software on another company's uninspired hardware. He was allergic to the idea of unapproved apps or content polluting an Apple device's beauty. It did not always optimize short-term earnings, but in a world of junky devices, incomprehensible error messages, and irritating interfaces, it produced amazing products with delightful user experiences. Being in the Apple ecosystem was as beautiful as wandering in one of Jobs' favorite Kyoto Zen gardens. Neither sensation was generated by praising openness or letting a thousand flowers blossom. Control freaks may be fun. The fourth lesson is when behind, leapfrog. Innovative companies need to come up with novel concepts early. When it falls further behind, it skips forward. Jobs was the creator of the very first iMac. He made it useful for handling images and films, but he needed to remember the music. CDs were burned, downloaded, shared, and ripped by users of personal computers. CDs could not be burned on iMac slot drives. We had missed it. He could have updated the CD drive in the iMac, but instead, he developed an integrated system to revolutionize the music industry. iTunes, the iTunes Store, and the iPod are the only devices that allow users to purchase music, share it with others, organize it, store it, and play it better than any other option. Jobs only got to enjoy the success of the iPod partially. Instead, he was concerned about potential dangers. Music players could be incorporated into mobile phones by certain businesses. The iPhone was the beginning of the end for iPod sales. He observed that if we don't consume ourselves, someone else will. The fifth lesson is to prioritize products over earnings. Jobs ordered his staff to produce the first Macintosh insanely wonderful in the early 1980s. He never mentioned profit maximization or cost trade-offs. Don't worry about the price, just outline the computer's abilities, he urged the original team leader. Don't compromise was his first whiteboard message at the Macintosh team retreat. The expensive machine cost Jobs his job at Apple. The Macintosh made a dent in the cosmos by advancing the home computer revolution. Ultimately, he struck the proper balance, focus on product quality, and revenues would follow. Pepsi marketing and sales executive John Scully managed Apple from 1983 to 1993. After Jobs left, he prioritized business over product design, and Apple suffered. When the sales guys control the company, the product guys don't matter much, and many just turn it off. Scully came in at Apple, which was my fault and Balmer took over at Microsoft. Jobs returned to Apple to make revolutionary products, including the iMac, PowerBook, iPod, iPhone, and iPad. My objective has been to develop an enduring organization where employees are motivated to make incredible things. Everything else was secondary, he said. Yes, making a profit allows you to produce amazing things. But products, not profits, were the motivation. Scully made money the priority. It's subtle, but it affects everything, who you employ, who gets promoted, what you talk about in meetings. The sixth lesson is to impute. In 1979, Jobs' guru Mike Markula wrote him a paper with three concepts. First, empathy and focus. The third, impute, was odd, but Jobs made it a core belief. He knew consumers judge a product or company by its packaging and presentation. Mike taught me that people judge a book by its cover, he said. So he obsessively designed the 1984 Macintosh box. Jobs also patented the Jewel-like iPod and iPhone enclosures. Jobs designed and redesigned. He and I've thought unpacking was theatrical and showcased the merchandise. When you open an iPhone or iPad box, 
we want that tactile experience to set the tone for how you perceive the product, Jobs remarked. Jobs sometimes design machines to impute signals rather than just function. After returning to Apple, he was shown a design by Ive with a small recessed handle on the top for the new, fun iMac. Semiotic, not practical. Desktop. Few would carry it. Jobs and I've noticed that computers still intimidate many people. The new machine would appear pleasant, polite, and helpful with a handle. The handle allowed iMac touch. Jobs told the manufacturing team, no, we're doing this. He didn't explain. The seventh lesson is to pursue perfection. Jobs hit the pause button and redesigned almost every product. Toy Story 2. After Jeff Katzenberg and Disney, who had bought the movie rights, pressed Pixar to make it rougher and darker, Jobs and director John Lasseter suspended production and reworked the script to make it friendlier. Likewise, he and his shop guru, Ron Johnson, delayed the introduction of Apple stores for a few months to reorganize them around activities rather than product categories, like the iPhone. Early designs encased glass screens in aluminium. Jobs visited I've Monday morning. I didn't sleep last night because I realized I don't love it, he said. I've quickly realized Jobs was right. His observation embarrassed him. The iPhone should have been about the display, but its casing interfered with it. The equipment needed to be more task-oriented and efficient. Jobs told the team, guys, you've killed yourselves over this design for the previous nine months, but we'll tweak it. We'll all work nights and weekends, and we can give you guns to kill us. The team agreed. One of Jobs' proudest Apple moments. Jobs and I finished iPads identically. Jobs could have been more satisfied. It wasn't portable. They needed to demonstrate one-handed grabbing. They rounded the bottom edge for easy gripping. Engineering had to connect connections and controls in a thin, basic lip that sloped gently underneath. The change delayed Jobs' product. Jobs perfected the invisible. As a child, he helped his father build a backyard fence and was encouraged to pay equal attention to the back. Nobody will know, Steve said. You will know, his father responded. His father said a true artisan uses good wood for the fence and cabinet backs against the wall. Artists were perfectionists. Jobs managed Apple II and Macintosh circuit boards using this lesson. In both cases, he directed the engineers back to line up the chips for nice boards. Engineers found this odd since Jobs had sealed the Macintosh. Nobody will see the PC board, one claimed. Jobs, like his father, wanted everything to be beautiful, including inside the box. Good carpenters use good wood even though no one sees the cabinet back. He advised them to be painters. After rebuilding the board, Steve had the engineers and Macintosh team sign their names for engraving inside the case. Real artists sign their work, he remarked. The eighth lesson is to only allow the best in the business. Jobs was notoriously irritable and demanding. He treated people poorly, but his drive for perfection and desire to work with the finest drove him. He did it to prevent the bozo explosion managers being so courteous that substandard individuals stay. If something sucks, I tell folks to their face, he stated. Honesty is my duty. He said maybe if he had been friendlier. But it's not me, he said. Maybe there's a better way, a gentleman's society where we all wear ties and speak in this Brahmin language and use code words, but I don't know that way because I'm middle class from California. Was his rage and brutality necessary? Unlikely. He may have motivated his troops differently. Steve's contributions could have been made without so many stories about him scaring folks, Apple co-founder Wozniak stated. I prefer patience and fewer conflicts. A firm can be a good family. If the Macintosh project had been conducted my way, things probably would have been a mess, he said, which is accurate. It's vital to remember that Jobs's rudeness and roughness inspired. He inspired Apple staff to produce innovative things and believe they could do the unimaginable. The result determines his worth. Jobs had a close-knit family, and his top players stayed longer and were more loyal than those at other firms, even those with kinder and gentler CEOs. CEOs that copy Jobs' toughness without understanding his loyalty risk making a big mistake. Jobs said, I've learned over the years that you don't have to baby truly good people. Expecting greatness might inspire it. Ask any Mac employee. They will say it was worth the pain. Most do. The ninth lesson is to engage face-to-face. Jobs valued face-to-face -face interactions because he realized the internet world might be isolating. There's a tendency in our network society to imagine that ideas can be created through email and iChat, he said. Random meetings spark creativity. You run into someone, ask what they're doing, say wow, and soon you're cooking up all sorts of ideas. He designed the Pixar facility for impromptu meetings and cooperation. If a building doesn't support that, 
you'll lose a lot of invention and the magic that serendipity sparks, he said. So we plan the building to make people leave their offices and socialize in the central atrium with people they might not see. The cafe, mailboxes, meeting rooms, 600-seat theater, and two smaller screening rooms opened into the atrium. Steve's theory worked from day one, Lassiter says. I started seeing people I hadn't seen in months. This facility promotes teamwork and creativity like no other. Jobs preferred informal meetings over formal presentations. Every Wednesday afternoon, he met with his marketing and advertising staff and executive team to brainstorm ideas. Slideshows were outlawed. Jobs said he hated PowerPoint presentations. People would present a dilemma. Instead of slides, I wanted them to discuss. PowerPoint is unnecessary for experts. And the tenth lesson is to stay hungry, stay foolish. The two major San Francisco Bay Area social movements of the late 1960s shaped Steve Jobs. The hippie and anti-war counterculture featured rock music, and anti-authoritarianism. The second was the Silicon Valley hacker culture of engineers, geeks, wireheads, cyberpunks, hobbyists, and garage entrepreneurs. Various routes to personal enlightenment, Zen and Hinduism, meditation and yoga, primal scream therapy, and sensory deprivation. When he was in high school, he loved the 1971 final issue of Stuart Brand's Whole Earth Catalog that mixed these cultures. He brought it to college in the Apple Farm commune where he resided after dropping out. On the back cover of their final issue was a shot of an early morning country road, the kind you would find yourself hitchhiking on if you were so daring, he said. Stay hungry. Stay foolish. Jobs balanced his business and engineering side with his hippie, enlightenment-seeking rebel side. His behavior, the women he dated, his cancer diagnosis, and his business, reflected the contradictions, convergence, and final synthesis of all these elements. Jobs' advertising showed that he was still a hacker and hippie even after Apple became corporate. For example, the 1984 AD portrayed a renegade woman outrunning the thought police to throw a sledgehammer at Big Brother's screen. Here's to the wild ones, Jobs wrote for the Think Different commercials after returning to Apple. Misfits. Rebels. Disruptors. Round pegs in square holes. While some perceive them as the crazy ones, we see genius, he said. Because insane people alter the world. I would like to conclude this video by saying, Steve Jobs' life and work offer valuable insights for managers at all levels. His emphasis on simplicity and clarity in communication, passion for excellence, attention to detail, encouragement of creativity and innovation, willingness to take calculated risks and fail, continuous learning and adaptation, and building a strong team are all essential for success in the dynamic and ever-changing business world. By embracing these 10 lessons, managers can create a culture of innovation, inspire their team to excel, and drive their organization towards success. Jobs' legacy serves as a reminder that great leadership is not just about achieving results but also about inspiring and motivating people to achieve their full potential. So there you have it, 10 lessons from Steve Jobs for every managers. With this, we have come to an end of this video, I hope it was helpful. Comment your thoughts in the section below. Do subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification bell, never to miss an update from the Invensys Learning Channel. Also, if this has spiked your interest and you want to learn more about project management and its practices, check out Project Management Certification Training by Invensys Learning. We at Invensys Learning, provide interactive instructor-led certification training by trainers with rich domain experience and expertise. We also provide mock tests to make you confident while appearing for the certification exams, access to case studies prepared by the industry experts and personalized LMS with lifetime access that contain course resources. Thank you. Have a nice day.